Please note that the views expressed on this program are those of the individuals who speak them, and not necessarily those of Portsmouth Community Radio, its Board of Trustees, members, volunteers, or underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Spirit Radio. I am your host, Willie Hassel. Along with my co-host, Lynn Nickerson, we will take you on a journey, a journey into the unknown where the paranormal becomes the normal, a journey to a world cloaked in darkness where reality becomes a thin veil. So sit back, relax, and join us as we venture into the shadows, the darkness, the unknown, and back. Once again to Spirit Radio, the Paranormal Experience. I am your host, Willie Hassel, your gatekeeper to the dark side, your guide to the realm of the unknown, the unseen, the unthinkable. And of course, along with me is the always lovely, the mystical, the mysterious, Lynn Dickerson, and good evening. Hey, good evening, Willie. How are you doing? I'm doing okay for an old guy. (laughs) I think we we went through that last week. Yeah, we're certainly having unseasonably warm weather, aren't we? It's going to stay like this all winter long. Didn't you? Didn't oh, you I that? hadn't heard that, but that's really no. good news. <laughs> yeah, right, right, through, uh, right through the winter. Uh, New Hampshire is going to be up in the uh, 50s, low 60s. Ah, that's what you heard. So yeah, the new good weather is in New Hampshire. <laughs> that's right. Hmm. Oh, I know. You're just over the line there. So <laughs> <laughs> you may just miss out on it. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Well, once again, we have some exciting guests, and I bet you just love to read that intro. Hey, I bet you're right. <laughs> Tonight on Spirit Radio, the Paranormal Experience, we welcome once again Betty Andreasen Luca and her husband, Bob Luca. And this is their third appearance on the show, and it is always a pleasure to have them join us. And being, being at the center of one of the most famous visitation and abduction cases in history, the Andreasen Affair, Betty's story has been well documented in several books by Raymond E. Fowler. And tonight, both Betty and Bob have had a lifetime of contact and abduction experiences with beings from other worlds, and so they are both going to share their experiences with us tonight. So let us welcome now, once again, to Spirit Radio, Betty, Andreas, and Luca, and Bob Luca. Good evening. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Well, thank you. Great. Can you hear us okay? I. It's a little... Soft. A little right. soft? Yeah. Okay, we'll see what we can do here, raise our voices. Um, so nice to have you back on again. Oh, thank you. Um, Happy to be on. <laughs> welcome back. Um, well, for those of our listeners who are unfamiliar with Bob and Betty Luke, I just want to briefly review, review your history so that everybody is on the same page. Um, so your history kind of starts with uh, Raven E. Fowler, who, is a military ser- who has a military service background and who presently resides in Maine. He wrote five books about the both of you, your contact experiences, in addition to a re-release of his earliest book on the subject, which includes The Andreasen Affair, Parts 1 and 2, The Watchers, The Watchers 2, and The Andreasen Legacy. And Mr. Fowler is an expert at regressive hypnosis, research, and record-keeping, while not losing sight of the human element, because at the root of all this retelling is a great human interest story. Now, these books, which are all well-written and beautifully illustrated by Betty, I might add, reveal an incredible story. And the story all began... To the best of Betty's recollection, in South Ashburn, Mass., at about the age of 30, however, future regression would reveal that contact actually began when she was a child. And although Betty didn't know Bob at the time, during the same time frame as Betty, he had begun experiencing contact himself, although he was unaware of it as a child. And it wasn't until many years later, when once Betty had moved to Florida, that Bob, while traveling, had made a last-minute decision to visit Florida, where his 
this serendipitous meeting with Betty took place. So this was about the time your first your first conscious recollection was about what, 1967, and it was just after three really well-known events, and that would be number one, Betty and Barney Hill of Portsmouth in 1961, followed by the UFO flap that became known as the incident at Exeter, and then the third was the great blackout on November 9th of 1965, or most of the Upper East Coast, the North, North East Coast was blacked out. So, Bob, I wanted to kind of start with with some of your recollections, because I know that uh, Betty's experiences are somewhat well known, but I'd like to get your version of what you think has been happening to you. And I know that the abduction started at a young age for you, although you weren't aware of it until sometime in adulthood. But do you think you could, do, do you have a feeling as to what the purpose was then? So um, I'm having a very hard time on my phone hearing you. Are you really? Um, well, I think I'll be better off if I hang up this phone and Betty and I just go on one. The volume should be louder. All right. Okay, good. We'll okay. try that. Okay, I'm going to hang this phone up. Okay. So what I wanted to get into with... Okay, I can hear you. Oh, wow, that was quick. <laughs> and there he is. He must have been right I next was, door. I was getting a little worried. I didn't know what I was supposed to say. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know what? I can hear you better. So um, I was wondering about, you know, those experiences that you had, what you felt the purpose was. Okay, well, the, the one when I was very young, um, what they told me at that time is that they were preparing something for mankind oh. in the future that would be good for mankind. And they also said that people that had seen them, they told me they'd seen many, many people, mm -hmm. and that in the future these people would meet, and they would not be fearful when they saw them again, which I took to mean, or, or as I got older, I took to mean that, you know, in the future, like I met Betty, and we had been abducted together, and so the fear factor is kind of gone because you're, you're almost expecting this. Yeah. And in... Um, Betty had an experience in 1944. That was my first experience as well. I lived in Connecticut. She lived in Massachusetts. And her adult experience was in 1967, mm -hmm. as was mine. Hers was in the, in the winter months, and mine was in the middle of the... Uh, That's summer. really strange, isn't it? And it, Well, it's, it's just kind of strange. And even when we met in uh, 1977... I was working, uh, I was a single guy, and I was working as a service manager for a new car dealership. Now, this was a great job because I had a new car every three months, a good oh. salary, all my benefits paid, and I was kind of a hard-working guy. <clears throat> Yet when a friend approached me about taking a trip around the country to look for work in some other states, I just felt compelled to take this trip. And I went in and I told my boss that I would need a month off. And he said, no. <laughs> you know, he couldn't, couldn't give me a month off. Well, I thought about it over the weekend and went home and gave us some serious thought. And I went in on Monday. For some reason, I just told him his name was Bob, too. <laughs> and I said, Bob, there's only a couple things we can do. I said, you can give me the time off, you can fire me, or I can quit. But I'm going on this trip. Now, anybody that knows me would know that's highly unusual for me. Not like you, huh? Yeah, very much so, to give <laughs> up a, a good-paying job like that. Well, finally, he agreed that I could take the trip. And my friend Eddie and I had been around the country, out through uh, Texas and California and Oregon. And we were at a rest area in Idaho and decided on the spur of the moment, basically, to go to Florida. Now, from Idaho directly back to Connecticut wasn't too bad a run. But to turn and go all the way down to Florida and then back to Connecticut, that's several thousand miles yeah. uh, away from our planned journey. But when we got to, <coughs> excuse me, when we got to Florida, uh, one night we were having supper um, with my friend Eddie's sister-in-law who lived in Pompano Beach. And she happened to bring up that she worked with a woman 
to have a UFO experience. And, boy, I, you know, light bulbs went off. I said, wow. I said, you know, I'd like to talk to this woman because for 10 years uh, I had told only my parents and my best friend, who was a local police officer, what I had experienced, what I had remembered. And uh, so I went down to see Betty where she worked, and she would not talk to me because Rick <laughs> told her that reporters would be bugging her because of the book and all. Mm-hmm. And I had a very hard time convincing her. It took me quite a while, but I finally convinced her to have lunch with me the next day, which she did. We went out for lunch. We talked about our different experiences and all. And from that day forward, I've been buying her lunch like every day. <laughs> I heard about and, that. <laughs> now, here's the thing. At that time, if I'd have known what would have been involved with the book, with the government, with the harassment, I might have given that lunch a little bit more thought. You might have thought it over once or twice, but it would have been the same decision. Yeah. You know that. You, you still would have done it. Yeah, I just like to give her a hard time because she's sitting here giving me, throwing dirty looks and darts at me. I'm sure she can see right through you, Bob. <laughs> but, uh, once, the, uh, once the book uh, did come out, we were, we were married at that time, and that's when we really started to have problems with the government and all. You know, people basically were pretty nice to us. We didn't get a lot of bad skepticism. I think probably someone like Betty and Barney had it much worse than us being the the very first ones out there. Right. Um, And someone like, also I felt bad for Travis Walton because of the way his case went where they the police were involved, and they thought his crew had murdered him and all, and I, mean, yeah. I, I think they really put him through the ringer. But Benny and I were, were kind of fortunate, because, you know, all we can do is explain what happened to us. Mm-hmm. And if people accept it, fine. If you don't believe it, fine. Because the way I look at things, a long time ago, people believed the Earth was flat. Well, yep. that didn't really affect the globe. You know, the Earth was still a globe. And later on in time, when President Kennedy said that we were going to go to the moon, some of the top minds in the United States told him they didn't believe we could do it with the technology we had. Mm -hmm. And yet, we did it. So if somebody wants to believe what we're telling them, which is, you know, being as honest as we can be, that's fine. If the skeptics, well, if you haven't ever witnessed anything like this for yourself, it's kind of hard to accept for some people. Yeah, the same thing with ghosts. You just have no idea until you experience it. Well, that, <laughs> that's another thing. We, I don't think we talked about before. We didn't, Bob, and I wanted to get into that, about the paranormal activity, the government fallout in this conversation with you um before we get into that what about the episode you were still in florida and you had a visitation while you were both in an rv and the little gray sprinkled sparkles in the air saying that too many were watching and listening electronically which that was very interesting Um, yeah i'm i'm gonna let betty explain that experience to you and then i will tell you what i found afterwards what the effect was Oh, all I'll right. I'll let her tell you what happened. That was in uh, Higginham, Connecticut. Oh. A uh, big uh, RV that we had at the time. And I'll let Betty tell you what happened and why they sprinkled those sparkles around. They explained that to her. Okay, and I'd like you to get back on then to, to finish telling right, about the I'll, government I'll follow-up. What, okay, what good. What some of the results were from that. Okay. And here she is. Hi, man. Hi, Betty. Yeah, uh... It, it was strange. Uh, I was at home, and uh, the thing was uh, a being did appear there, and it, uh, they came to take me out again. And at that particular point, uh, 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 I got up from the couch, and uh, he said that there were people listening or uh, electronics going on, listening to what was going on. And so he had a little pouch on him uh, around his uh, uh, body, and he opened it up, and he sprinkled the sparkly stuff all around. Mm -hmm. And that was when he uh, took me out. He took me uh, off and away. Away from the RV? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, And, oh, go ahead. Okay. 
Well, uh, there was so many different experiences I've had, Lynn, that I can it's imagine. difficult to remember every bit of them because yeah. we, there's been the watchers and the watchers too, mm-hmm. and then also uh, the family uh, uh, one, and then this book that Bob and I are now writing, Lifting the Veil. There'll be a great deal of information in there about yes. our regular life, how we were, and everything, and there'll be bits and pieces of new information, and actually, uh, toward the end, there'll be my last encounter. Wonderful. And, uh, you know, it deals with the elders, with the, the uh, gray beings, mm-hmm. and everything that has been going on in our life. Also, some paranormal things have happened. We have not had an easy life, believe me. I know. A uh, lot of harassment and strange uh, experiences. Uh, you you yes. say you say your last encounter, meaning your most recent. Uh, the, well, the most recent, yeah, yeah. the very okay. last. They, uh, yeah, I that, mean they. they, they I remember they, what, actually what happened. Well, I can't uh, say a lot about it because no, okay. we are going to have the book out. But what really thrilled me was I was left with some evidence. Oh. Because when I got up. I saw on our mirror uh, in the uh, fifth wheel that we were living in was the imprint of one of the being's hands, oh. like a smudge of a hand. Yeah. And I didn't know what to do. And I showed Bob. He saw it. My daughter was coming over with my two grandchildren. She saw it. And we thought we got to get a hold of Ray Fowler. Uh, the only thing was he was on vacation and so we didn't know what to do. And I, you know, I didn't want to lose that. That's one piece of evidence I've got that, you know, even though people may think I'm crazy or what I've gone through is just out of, out of this world, which it is sort of. But, I mean, I have a piece of evidence. I was so happy to have a piece of evidence there. But, of course, it would fade away if sure. I didn't do anything about it. And I didn't know what to do. So Did- I took a... A photograph? Uh, a capsule of uh, charcoal, and I sprinkled it on, because it was sort of greasy. It looked a little bit greasy-like. Mm-hmm. And I sprinkled the uh, charcoal on there, and then I didn't know, well, how am I going to take this off? I tried to put a white paper up against it, but that didn't do it. I'm thinking, you know, as time went by, how am I going to get that off? Because that's proof positive. And so then I thought of the sticky paper with the white, uh, which you usually use for um, different papers that you want to keep for a long time. So I tore apart apart the uh, sticky plastic, clear plastic from the white paper, and I stuck that up on the, uh, the mirror. And I was able to pull off the print really? and put it on the white paper. There were a few tiny bubbles in there because you can't get it even right away. But as time passed, those bubbles just uh, disappeared. Hmm. So I have the handprint of one of the beings. Wow. Well, that's that's interesting. Uh how, how big is it, I just out of curiosity? Uh, well, it's a lot bigger than my hand. It, it has the three fingers, and uh, the two fingers are a lot bigger than the third one. And it's kind of big. Long, maybe like four it's inches long or something? Long fingers and, and kind of full. Wow. Very Did you... strange. But I, I was so happy about it, but it was so... Uh, worried that, you know, here is my proof positive, you know, because I'm sure people think, oh, this woman is crazy, you know, (laughs) what she's been going through. But you're going to see also in the book that Bob and I have written, you'll find out a lot of strange things. I was going to ask you at the end of the show for an update on that, because I know that you were uh, working on that. I wanted to get the release on it and so forth. Um, Did you happen to get a photograph of that hand? No, Bob tried to take a photograph of it, and there was, see, in the fifth wheel, uh, there were levels to it, and that level was around the area for the closets, and there were mirrors. Oh. There was at least four or five mirrors there. Too much reflection. And the bathroom off to the side. So when he kept on, you know, flicking the camera to try to capture it, it was impossible. The mirrors just lit up bright light. Okay. Hmm. So when you were in the RV and he sprinkled the stuff, um, why did he sprinkle it in there and then take you outside? Uh, yeah. 
uh, they took me outside um, of the craft, and they took me. I'm trying to think. You know, I'm going to be 79 years old in January, oh, no. and I can, <laughs> And I'm telling you, I, 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 my mind does not remember as well as it, it was before. You do remarkably but, well. Well, thank you very much. But anyways, yes, I, they took me over. Uh, I think it was where all the clear balls of light, uh, clear balls were that they were showing me. Uh, something about them, that they were keepers of uh, uh, intelligence. Oh. Well, you know, what I have read, I, I, I watch uh, Project Camelot, and Carrie Cassidy interviews a lot of controversial pre- people with a lot of uh, conspiracies and so forth. And she was interviewing one particular man, and he told her that he had to stop talking because... They were being listened to, and and she wanted to know well, why and how. And he was saying they have the technology that is beamed through a satellite to detect the frequency of voices to determine what is being said and who is saying it. Oh. So I'm sure that that's what the ET was kind of implying that you were being listened to. Yes. Electronically. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Yeah. Onto it. Yeah. So um, yeah, but we've had so many different things happening. Like within when we lived in the fifth wheel too, uh, what happened was Bob was sleeping. I was up. It was a, a warm evening, and I was wide awake. And so I went out in uh, outside of the RV and or the fifth wheel, and I was standing on the platform there. And I'm looking around at the woods. So it was quiet and everything. And all of a sudden, a blue ball of light. I saw a light out in the forest area, Mm. and it was coming closer and closer to me. And I I became very frightened from it, and I wanted to go in, but I couldn't move. And I was picked up at that time. And that is written about in The Watchers. Oh, what year was that, Betty? Um, That I don't know. I'm not very good at keeping (laughs) the time. But uh, The Watchers could be... Uh, for people uh, to read about it uh, at the library would possibly have the Watchers 1 and the Watchers 2. I've got Watchers 1. I haven't seen the 2 yet, but I've got to get a copy of that. <laughs> Follow up on... I've got to get a whole picture. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps you could get Bob back on so that he can talk about the fallout from what he experienced as far as the government harassment. Okay, I will. Yes, okay. hold on one moment. Oh, with the, um, in relationship to the government? Yeah, you were followed by unmarked cars and people were taking your pictures, your phone was bugged, lost email, the computer well, invasion. They, they, they used a number of government agencies um, to partially to harass us and partially to keep us under surveillance. Um, the hmm. IRS was the first that uh, we had audits every year. For the first three or four years. That is harassment. <laughs> it was so obvious that it was harassment. <sighs> we had a very fiery uh, Italian um, a CPA that, that was doing our taxes. Mm-hmm. And we get into some real shouting matches at the uh, during the audits. And uh, the last year I went, I didn't take, uh, we didn't use the CPA. And they asked me to produce documents that were 12 years old. Now, no. Uh, I don't, you know, by law, you don't have to keep documents more than seven years. And I knew that. So I told the auditor, I said, no. I said, I'm not, I don't have to give you those documents, and I'm not going to. So it had uh, to do with my, my uh, first wife and child support payments and mm-hmm. whatnot. And he told me, he said, well, well, we can audit her, you know, and get those documents. So, well, we I didn't get along with her that well at the time, so I told him, I said, well, you want to get busy then, don't you? (laughs) But uh, some of the nasty things, they would not accept canceled checks as proof of payment for, like, our water and sewer taxes and things like that. What would they accept as evidence? Right. What would they accept? I had to go to the towns where, um, where we had... 
uh, property taxes. I had to go to the bank where we had savings and checkings and get signed statements from officials in those places. You're kidding. And they thought they were getting me wild, but I was just laughing at them because I thought it was so foolish, you know, it, it, they couldn't get me wild. And I think that got them more irritated. Then they also uh, used the FBI. The FBI had us under surveillance for a long time. And, and But doing what? Just following you? Well, uh, they followed us in cars where the license plates were unmarked. Because um, I think I mentioned before, as a, as a young fellow, I used to build race cars and race on the street because we didn't have <laughs> any race tracks where I lived. And I got pretty good at it. So a few times when those cars were following us, I got behind them. Ooh. And I got the license plates and gave them to uh, Officer uh, Larry Fawcett, who was also a UFO investigator and a police lieutenant. And he ran the plates, and they came back several times as unissued. Oh. Another thing that was proof positive. Uh, one evening, Betty and I decided to go to Florida, and uh, this was during the winter. We were living in Connecticut. It was really cold. So about 2 o'clock in the morning, we hooked up our camp trailer, and we took off for Florida. That was uh, like a Sunday morning, about 2 a.m., mm -hmm. or 3 a.m. And by Wednesday, two FBI agents came into my job where I work, and they questioned my coworkers and my supervisor, and my supervisor told me that they had photo ID. And <clears throat> sometime later, the uh, Connecticut Magazine did an article on us, and they went back and interviewed my coworkers and whatnot, and they did state publicly in the article that uh, the government had been in there looking for me. <sighs> when we got back, uh, Betty and I went to the federal building in New Haven, Connecticut, went to the FBI office and asked them what they wanted. And we got the standard answer, well, we can neither confirm nor deny that we were there. And okay. So while we were there, I asked them, I said, well, why, why are you fellas tapping our telephone? And <laughs> it was kind of funny because here we walked in off the street, and supposedly mm -hmm. this agent didn't know us. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, he said, uh, he said, we always get blamed, but in your case, it's not us, it's Air Force Intelligence. Ooh. Well, sometime later, I had a chance to talk to someone in Air Force Intelligence, and they said, no, we'd have to get a court order, and it wouldn't be us. It was more than likely the FBI. But I kind of leaned toward believing it was the Air Force because I believe in Betty and Barney Hill's case, they found that their phone was being tapped uh, from nearby Pease Air Force Base. Oh, that makes sense. So I'm... Um, Kind of leaning more toward it, you know, that it was um, the Air Force that, that was doing that. Our, and the other thing... Go ahead, Bob. Uh, the helicopters started just about the time the book was being published. And I noticed them coming over our house. And what made what was interesting, I was learning to fly at the time to get my pilot's license. <clears throat> so I was pretty much up on the rules and regulations. But these helicopters were flat black. And they had no ID numbers. Hmm. Now, that's against federal regulations. Mm -hmm. They have to have ID numbers. So I took some pictures. I sent them to Ray Fowler. He said, well, you know, don't be paranoid. Like, you're, you're probably just in a flight path. <laughs> well, it got to where they came often enough and low enough where our next-door neighbor, who was a city councilwoman, started to document the times and dates of the flights. But... <clears throat> We were only in that house for a year, and we moved to another town, to Cheshire, Connecticut. When we moved, the thing started right from the get-go. The first thing that happened was we had dropped the two girls off at the high school in Cheshire, mm -hmm. and we had to go to the closing for the house that day. So we told them when they got out of school to walk to the house and that we would be back as soon as we got done from the closing. The girls got out of school, went to the house, someone was inside. And they said they were from the phone company. But Betty and I didn't even have the key yet, and the, the house was locked. Wow. We were still at the closing. So I think what happened, um, I think they were bugging the house at that time. Yeah, I'll just tell you why. We had, we had a friend that <clears throat> later on became a scientific advisor to the vice president. And when he came over to the house to 
tell me a few things, he would not talk to me inside. Ah. Hey, we got to go out in the yard. That's a good. That's a good sign, Bob. Oh, yeah, if I yeah. could interrupt you for just a moment, we're just just after the bottom of the hour. Then we okay. need to take a quick break, but we'll be right back, and we're going to continue with Bob and Betty Luca talking about their abduction experiences, and we're going to continue with the helicopter stories. So please don't go anywhere. Supernatural Magazine, the UK's newest paranormal magazine, provides support to Spirit Radio, the paranormal experience. It is the magazine's goal to bring every aspect of supernatural news and research from around the world under one roof to create a universal platform for all those interested in the supernatural. More information is available at supernaturalmagazine.com. You are listening to Spirit Radio, the paranormal experience on WSCA 106.1 FM. And we'll be right back after this short break. Listening to Spirit Radio, the Paranormal Experience on WSCA 106.1 FM in Portsmouth West End. And from the community calendar, it's time to get out your skates and because seasonal skating is now open at the Puddle Duck Puddle Duck Pond at Strawberry Bank Museum. The rink will be open daily 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. now until February 29th, 2016. Uh, skate and event rentals, sharpening, and lessons will also be available. There will even be free skating at selected times, Tuesday through Thursdays. For information can be found on their website, puddleduckpond.org, or by calling them at 603-422-0600. The pond is located at the Strawberry Bank Museum, 14 Hancock Street in Portsmouth. And some upcoming guests. Okay, our upcoming guest list starts with uh, December 19th. Alex Matsuo, who's an actress and an author of three books, will be joining us to discuss her book, The Haunting of the 10th Avenue Theater. December 26th, we're taking off for Christmas. January uh, 2nd, Willie and I are, um, we've scheduled a discussion titled Maritime Mysteries and Haunted Ships. January 9th, Jeremy Dontremont will return. He's going to be talking to us about West Coast lighthouses and their ghosts. January 16th, Valerie Lafaso and Mike Stevens from so- Seacoast Saucers will be joining us. It's a new group, and they're going to be telling us about that. And uh, it's a place where people can air their personal concerns about UFO experiences and sightings. January 23rd, Andy Kitt, who is an author and founder of the Kitt Research Institute in nearby Stratum, New Hampshire, will be joining us in the studio to talk about his center. And January 30th, we're welcoming back uh, Reverend Betty Comerford and her uh, her writing investigative partner, Reverend Stephen Wilson, and they'll be talking about their one of their other books, The Reluctant Empath, and that's our uh, upcoming guest list. All right, and let's uh, go back to the phones now tonight with tonight's guests, uh, Betty, Andreas, and Luca, and Bob Luca. Welcome back. Well, thank you so much. Hi, welcome back. Okay, so we were talking about the helicopters, and you you sent a letter to what the Inspector General and the at- in Attorney General. Is that right? Well, yeah, that, but that had to do with our computer being hacked. Oh, okay. <coughs> <laughs> um, our computer was hacked by the United States Navy uh, Space Weapons uh, Systems Division. Wow. And 48 hours later, it was hacked by the United States Army. Now, um, both these hacks took place from the same physical street address, which is an office where the Department of Defense has a number of computers. And these computers were, in fact, under the control of the Department of Defense. Hmm. So I did write to them and asked them why 
my computer had been hacked, and I sent them the information that I got from uh, my security software. So they couldn't deny it because I had the ID numbers of the computers, the mm-hmm. physical street mm-hmm. address, the uh, fact that they were Department of Defense computers. And I got a letter back from the um, Inspector General of the Army stating that, yes, in fact, it was one Navy computer, one Army computer, and they would do an investigation. Well, to make a long story short, that never happened. So since then, um, I had been to my state senator. He tried filing for me. He got the same runaround. Um, I contacted the United States Attorney General. They told me that uh, computer hacking came under um, the FBI, (laughs) under their jurisdiction. So I had written the FBI, and they kind of just passed it off. I wrote them back a second time and said I was not happy that they they didn't uh, give me the courtesy even of a reply. And um, I can always prove they got the mail because I send all, all these mails certified with a return receipt. Mm-hmm. Right now, I have a case filed with the FBI uh, main office in Washington, D.C. Um, I did file a claim. They gave me a case number, and I have not as yet heard back from them on that. So I, I don't know what's going to happen there. How long? It was because they hacked our computer. Now, one thing I think Betty and I have been most fortunate, a lot of these things, like like the uh, helicopters, the phone being tapped, and things of that nature, we have witnesses. Mm. And I'll give you a prime example. During, um, I don't know, I think it was around 83, 84, Betty and I had done some private lectures in Connecticut. And we were at the home of a psychologist, and she had about 15 or 20 of her uh, friends there. We did a a private lecture for them, and Betty had gotten finished. And I just really just started to talk about the helicopters (laughs) when the familiar sound of the rotor blades could be heard at this house. How ironic. Right on cue. (laughs) Right, right on cue. So um, this makes me wonder what technology they were using to keep track of us that closely. Yeah. But, you know, you could say, well, this is a coincidence. Except that happened again several weeks later when we were doing a lecture for a New Britain dentist at his home. And again, all the people saw this helicopter as it made a curve around the house at both of these places. (sighs) So... Uh, later, sometime later, another two or three weeks later, we were doing a lecture for a car, uh, contractor in Meriden, Connecticut, and the same thing happened. So here we've got a, a whole group of witnesses that can say, yeah, you know, these helicopters are stalking them. Uh, on another occasion, I was in a gun store, uh, sporting goods store on East Main Street in Meriden, Connecticut, and I had gone in to buy a rifle because I like to hunt. Mm-hmm. Well... Betty was sitting out in the car in front, and when I went in the store, within minutes, a large black helicopter arrived and stopped and hovered directly over the store. That's kind of frightening. Now, this sounds kind of weird, but they have, uh, you know, some of the technology they have, like thermography, they can see inside, they can see through your walls, ceilings, and things like that. Yeah, the heat signatures. Right. So I don't know what, you know, what they were after, but fortunately... Uh, after the thing left, the man came in and it came over to Betty from across the street. And he asked her if she saw that, and he verified that he did, and he turned out uh, to be a newspaper uh, reporter for a local uh, paper in Meriden, Connecticut. Also, Larry Fawcett, the police officer, when he got involved in our case, uh, he not only saw them over our home, but he had them show up over his house as well. Wow. When one evening, uh, Betty and I were doing um, a radio show from Connecticut, very much like this, and the way that house was situated, where the telephone was on the wall, we could see outside to the front of the house. Just before we started the show, a black Cadillac pulled up and parked going the wrong way on our side of the street, (laughs) and across the street, a white van pulled in and parked. Well... I thought that was kind of curious. Nobody ever got out of the van or the car. So while we were uh, on a break, 
I ran out, and I tried to look in this Cadillac, and the windows were tinted dark, and it was dark outside. I couldn't see anybody in there. And I thought of going over and rapping on the window, and then I thought, well, <laughs> that might not be the smartest <laughs> thing that, you know, that I could do. So we just let it go with that. But after a while, with the helicopters, I had tried to track them down. As I say, I was taking my flying lessons then. So I not only took photographs, but I got the approximate altitude, the compass heading, the mm-hmm. time of day, and photographs. And I mailed all this to everyone from the Federal Aviation Administration to the FBI, the CIA, the Army, the National Guard, the you know, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. And over a period of like seven or eight years, no one could identify whose helicopters these were. Mm. So Betty and I were out in Phoenix, uh, and we were doing a lecture. And I had gotten to the point where I had a bunch of slides with the helicopters that I was showing. And right after that, we got intermission. And during the intermission, the fellow came over to me that was very much uh, to me, military looking. I mean, he had the uh, buzz haircut. His his buttons on his shirt were right straight down the front, matched with his uh, buckle on his belt. He had highly polished black shoes. And he said, he used the word we. He said, we are only sending the helicopters so we don't have to hurt you. So I said, okay, thank you. But uh, what are you, you going to say to that? You know, not much. Yeah. But that wasn't just coincidence either because Betty and I had been doing a lecture at MIT in Massachusetts. And during the break, Dr. Alan Hynek, who everyone knows, the sure. UFO phenomena, ran over to Betty quickly, didn't have a conversation. He just said, look, he said, stick to philosophy and leave the military out of this. So apparently we were starting to get to him at that time because I had contacted a number of people at the, um, uh, at the Pentagon, uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and the CIA, and these people, unbelievably, were backing away from us. The CIA refused to give me an interview when I told them that we were interested in doing a book. No kidding. Uh, the Pentagon, and I have this on tape because I taped my conversations, finally told me nobody there will talk to me. <laughs> and Betty and I went to uh, NASA in Florida, in Cape Canaveral, and we, or Cape Kennedy, and we asked if we could have an interview with the administrator, and we were granted that. As we walked down, it was, oh, gosh, like blocks, a couple of blocks probably to where his office was. But the, uh, the guard at the gate told us where, uh, at the desk, told us where the office was. We walked down there, and when we got to the office, we were met outside by a secretary who told us that the administrator was not in. <laughs> when we were just told minutes earlier that he was. So apparently these people don't like it when the shoe is put on the other foot. Yeah. Um, you know, I was going to harass them because some of the stuff they did to us was like the helicopters were a pain in the neck. They came over our house very low. I mean, I could hit, hit them with a baseball without any problem. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of the things were more threatening. Like we had gone to Florida, and uh, we got as far as somewhere near Cape Canaveral. And we pulled into a um, KOA campground. Now, we had no intention of stopping there. It's just that I was tired at the time. So we pulled in there and decided to stay there and finish our trip the rest of the way down to Florida, uh, Pompano Beach in the morning. The manager of the campground came over to Betty and said, uh, your son had called. Now, this is impossible. No one knew we were there. Yeah. So this is their way of saying, you know, we know where you are. Yeah. You know, keep you, trying to keep you under pressure. Uh, on another occasion, we were flying from Connecticut to Chicago to do a TV show. And when I got to the desk, I was told that I had already boarded the plane. <laughs> and I said, no, well, that's not possible. I said, I'm, I'm Mr. Luca from, Conne- from Cheshire, Connecticut. So they were really just disrupting your life, weren't they? Sticking their nose in there where it didn't belong. Yeah, well, they, you know, it's. It's a, kind of a way of making, trying to make you paranoid, put it that way. Yeah, and, just make you miserable. You know, I, I just didn't buy it. I said, okay, okay fine. You know, I said, it, it's, I gave him my name. Larry Fawcett was there, the police officer. He came over, and we all talked. We got everything straightened out, got on the plane. Nobody was in my seat, <laughs> you know. But it's just 
one thing after another like that. I think they were trying to pressure us to see if we would uh, give in or yeah, basically shut up. Yeah. And that wasn't going to happen. Well, the other, one of the other things, our house in Cheshire, um, I don't know if I'd mentioned this before, but we woke up, or I woke up about 2, two to 3 in the morning. It was very late. And I remember I heard someone talking in our kitchen. Now, the kitchen was to the right uh, uh, off the small hallway uh, from our bedroom. I heard two men talking very distinctly. Mm -hmm. So I looked at the bottom of our bed. We had a large shepherd dog. Now, he would normally bark. And that dog got up on his front paws, and his feet slid out from under him, and he went right down on his face. I mean, just plopped right down on the ground. So, oh, something's wrong here. (laughs) So, excuse me. I reached in my nightstand for a pistol, and I was going to confront these guys, but that's the last thing I remember. Uh, We woke up in the morning. Betty said she had a terrible headache, as I did. We got dressed, went to our prospective jobs, came home, and Betty said that her left arm had been hurting her all day. And I said, that's funny. My right arm has been hurting me all day. Either side of the bed. We took off our shirts, and... Uh, there was, on both of us, there was a mark about an inch, inch and a quarter in diameter, a black and blue mark, with a very distinct puncture mark in the center. How did mm-hmm. they manage to do that without you seeing them? Or well, maybe they, they can't, you can't they can't, remember. They have a, a, a sleep agent, which I, what I think happened was, I think it was sprayed, probably sprayed into the house through the bedroom window. Jeez. To put us to sleep. And then once they got in the house, I think we were injected because... Apparently, they were looking for something. And um, well, anyway, getting back to that, I had uh, talked to our, our family doctor, and I said, look, if we go to the hospital, get blood drawn, you know, will, will anything show up? And he felt that by that time it was too long. And Washed out of your system. Uh, you know, blood tests wouldn't show yeah. up. But, you know, that to me was going too far. Oh, you're right. That's really just an invasion of privacy and rights. Yeah, and it's and you know, and then we had some uh, like threatening phone calls and stuff like that. But it, it was just stupid. I mean, it, it just sounded so phony that we didn't pay much attention to it. In fact, oh, I recorded one, and and it was more humorous than anything else. <laughs> it's well, still a cross to bear, though. Well, well, at least you can see the humor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, well, I just I, want to mention we only got about four minutes left here, Bob. Um, okay. So, Bob, if I could possibly get Betty on, I wanted to ask her a couple of questions about races. My and... gosh, I can find her, I'll bet. Oh. <laughs> Hold on for a second. She's right here. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Hello. Hi, Betty. Hi, Lynn. So we talked about, well, we haven't talked about races, actually. Um, they were talking about, well, you had been uh, under hypnosis, and the question was asked, like, who was it that was... Uh, interfering with your lives, and you mentioned they come from different planets, different realms, and some come from the very Earth. Do you have any more information on that? On- no, they, they, they did say that they came from the Earth, and there was a place on Earth that we do not know of. Now, I don't know if you would think that the scientists, you know, with the studies and everything, uh, that they would know every piece of the Earth, but sure. evidently there's a place now, I don't know if that would be like the Pacific Ocean or something like that, where they have not been able to probably go down deep enough or something. Well, there's Maybe also that. the hollow Earth theory, you know, the North Pole. Mm-hmm. That could be part of it, too. It could be that, too, yes. Um, do you feel, well, you had mentioned, still under hypnosis, you were asked the question by interrogator David, and I don't recall his last name, if there were many clans or races visiting the Earth now, and you replied, 70 so, right. Was, they, said, they said they have seventy. There are seventy races visiting planet Earth. And was there an indication of like what kind of a percentage of them were living here on Earth? Because some are human-like. No, they did not. They did not say anything like that. No. Okay. Just how, that they were visiting. There were over seventy, about seventy races visiting planet Earth. And now I, I recall that one uh, that you were talking about where the being had come into the trailer. We were uh, living in the trailer that was way down next to the woods and in the corner of the uh, woods and, and uh, I 
field there. Mm -hmm. And it was, he appeared there, the small being appeared there, and I was just laying on the uh, couch reading my Bible. That's what it was. And he, uh, I, I came out of myself and stood there before him. And that's what happened then. Wow. Uh, it was very strange that, uh, you know, that that happened. There was so, there's so much that have happened to has happened to me, Lynn, that it's almost impossible to keep it all in my mind oh, yeah. and remember, you know. Yeah. But I do recall that I was in two places at one time, and he did tell me about there were there were uh, others listening, and then he just took that stuff <laughs> out of his pocket and sprinkled it in the air. It was uh, like light or shiny thing. Yeah, well, kind of like fairy dust. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, but you know, I recall it. You know, it takes a while for my mind now that I'm getting older. It's getting hotter. <laughs> <to recall. laughs> well, I had a bunch Awful. of questions to ask you about. Um, you know, your not so much your experience with the one, but you know, your recollection of all that and the mechanics behind it, and also what was going on with lifting of the veil. But we are just at the end of the the show, Betty. Um, could you tell us about your website and how to get your books? Well, that is, uh, Bob uh, handles the uh, computer. Could I give him to you and you, he could tell you? Oh, sure. Sure. Is? Sure. Okay, thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you, Betty, for joining us. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, we have our website, andreasandaffair.com. Mm hmm. And uh, it, the uh, reprint of the Andreas and the Fair is also available on Amazon.com. Uh, if people go to our website, they can see a lot of the artwork that Betty has done, the government documents, letters I've gotten from the various government offices, and all uh, all on there. Terrific. So it makes uh, it a lot easier if people can physically see the things. That's right. Get a better understanding. And if they purchase some of the books, they will see Betty's wonderful artwork. It's just outstanding, and it really makes what was happening to her very clear. Yeah, she's, she's a great artist. Yes, yeah, she is. So okay. wonderful. Well, we have to thank you both so much for coming on, and I'm going to have to book another date for both of you because <laughs> we still have so much territory to cover. Would you like <laughs> okay. to come back on? Yeah, uh, that would be our pleasure anytime, Excellent. that's for right. sure. And we thank Wonderful. you so much for having right. us on this evening. Okay. Thank you again. Uh, th thank you, Bob, okay. for joining us, and, and thank you to Betty, too. Yes. Have a great well, evening. Uh, All right. Have a good night. I, thank you. I'm sorry that, uh, you know, I'm not very much with it. Both Bob Betty, and you're I fine. Uh, sinus for a few months, and it's been just terrible, Oh, uh, the sinus trouble. I hope you feel better. Well, thank you very much. Well, you're coming I'm back sorry, on. I'm not very much with it, as I usually am. Very well, helpful, though. Thank you, Betty. Yeah, th thank, thank you, Betty. Thank you for yeah. having us on. Yeah. God bless yeah. you, Paul. Yeah. You, yeah. too. Have, have a good night. We'll talk thank soon. Bye-bye. Okay, that is the end of Spirit Radio, the paranormal experience for another week. And the graveyard shift is coming right up, but Craig isn't here. Hey, he's back again. It's Daryl. <laughs> Daryl is going to uh, take care of the graveyard shift tonight. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for listening, and have a good evening. Mm -hmm.